Hello and welcome to Safe Pasture. My name is Sherry Hammers and we are continuing on in our holiest, uh, the holiest of all book series that I've entitled Jesus Our High Priest. But the, the book title is The Holiest of All by Andrew Murray. And today we are diving into chapter 96 and it's called Boldness and Patience. As he starts off with Hebrews 10, 35 through 36. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. And Andrew starts off with this verse. Cast not away your boldness. He says, When I have my hands filled, and something more tempting is offered, I may either directly cast away what I have, or by trying to take the new object into hands already full, may gradually lose hold of what I first held fast. Casting away our boldness always has its cause in something else that we allow to take its place in the heart. It may be sin, whether only rising in the heart or breaking out into act, or if it be not immediately confessed, I'm sorry, let me start that again. It may be sin, whether only rising in the heart or breaking out into act, if it be not immediately confessed and cleansed away. So he's saying, you know, if, if we don't immediately take care of our account with that and it's, it's sitting there, it can grow into something a little more bold that will uh, try to take the place of our boldness from God. He says it may be something in itself lawful, but which is allowed too large a share in our interest or affections. We, we touched on that last time, that even if something is good, it can start to um, take over. It can start to get out of balance. He says it may be something doubtful, so insignificant that it hardly appears worth considering, and yet which somehow robs us of perfect liberty in looking up into God's face. Isn't that exactly what the devil does? He will try to... You, you think, oh, wow, that show has a lot of off-color junk in it. or and, and the devil's like, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. You're just being too legalistic. And it's really, we need to really be listening to the Holy Spirit. Because a lot of times the Holy Spirit, he's going to respect our free will, right? So he's, he's not going to barge in, knock the door down, you know throw your TV on. He's, he's not going to do that. I, I heard a long time ago, I don't know if I heard this or read it somewhere, but I always think about this. I heard someone say one time that the Holy Spirit will nudge you. And have you ever been out in the pasture with a horse and maybe it wasn't even on a halter, it was just a, a pretty calm horse and it would come up behind you and you realize it was there and it kind of nudges you? kind of with its nose, it'll kind of nudge you. That's, that's how gentle the Holy Spirit will be. And the Bible compares the Holy Spirit, not just in the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, but, you know, as the Holy Spirit was seen as a dove, but a dove, it can be, uh, it can be scared away. Not that the Holy Spirit's afraid, but if you push the Holy Spirit away, He's, he's not going to, I mean, I don't want to put words in the mouth of God, but uh, and it, what the scripture doesn't say, but you can push God away and he'll respect that, right? Because I look, I think it's in first Peter, I think that's right, or James, it's, it's in James, sorry, but it says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. So when you push God away, you need to be the one that makes the step back toward him because he's going to respect, oh, you are you don't want to obey me? You don't want to listen? Okay. And that's, in a way, that's kind of scary for us because in our flesh, we think we're justified, you know, in, in pushing him away. We'll, we'll justify what our flesh wants if our flesh is in command. So that's what he was saying. This could be something that seems so insignificant that it's not even worth not even worth looking at, but when, I, I don't care what it is, how insignificant, you need to take a look at it. Because it could be the Holy Spirit uh, just, just nudging you and saying, hey, this isn't good. 
Anyway, I'll go on. He says, it may be care or fear. It may be self-effort or self-seeking, self-trust. Anything that is not in the perfect will of God loosens our hold on the boldness before God. And ere we know, in other words, before we know, we have cast it away. It is lost. So we can, our boldness, our courage that God gives us to be bold for him, it can be eked away. It can just be, it can be worn down by stupid things like, I want to watch this TV show even though it's got trash in it. And we're giving away our power in the kingdom. Isn't that, when you put it like that, doesn't it seem like, how in the world? What are we thinking? We, you know, in the last episode, we talked about where God says to reflect. You know, look on the past. Don't live there, but look on the past and see. And that's what we need to do. We need to kind of see sometimes where, where we're going and, you know, where we've been and where we're headed now. And take stock of maybe what's going on. Like, why don't, why don't I feel confident before God? Why don't I have the boldness I once had? We need to see, take, take inventory. He says, but we must not only know how we lose it. We want as much to know how to keep and increase it. The texts we quoted tell us, among the foundation truths we had it, we have a high priest able to sympathize. Let us come with boldness. And in the fuller teaching, it came again, having boldness to enter through the blood, through the blood, let us draw nigh. So we draw nigh through the blood. That's a whole other topic because I, I'm going to, after I'm finished with this book, that's the next topic I'm going to tackle is the power of the blood of Jesus. And how for, I don't know about you, but for me, that was just a phrase that, I, you know, people talked about the power of the blood. And I understood the words and the logic and the concept, but I did not understand the spiritual implications and the deeper things of God that are included in that. And so when we enter through the blood, that's when we draw near. Now, we're not going to hang on to our trash and think that we're going to enter through the blood and draw near to God. It's just not going to happen. He says, the high priest and the blood, these are the everlasting and unchanging ground of our confidence. It is as we consider Christ Jesus and follow him, as we grow in the knowledge and the faith of his blood, and enter through it into God's. So we grow in the knowledge of the faith of his blood and enter through it into God's knowledge. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to see, enter through it into God's. I believe he's talking about God's knowledge and God's faith, that we shall hold fast our boldness with an ever firmer grasp. So when we grow, we increase in knowledge and faith, of the blood, which I talked about, that's going to be my next series. We're going to be able to hold fast our boldness because our spiritual state is going to be at a higher level of holiness that we're going to be able to have power with God. And that may sound like some kind of, I don't know, proud statement like, oh, I'm reaching a new level of holiness. It's not like a pharisaical thing. It's just that when we get rid of the trash and the things of this world, then we have a we have a a greater power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Like John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. And see as God is able to have his place in your heart, his power, the workings of his Holy Spirit are going to be more evident. They're going to be more powerful through you as his vessel. And it's really, I mean, this is a simplistic example, but think about if you had a hose or a water pipe and you're trying to get water to go through. And well, you know, a hose is a great example because if you've ever been out trying to water something or fill up a bucket or a pool or something and you don't know it, but somehow the hose gets a kink in it and now it's got just a little trickle coming through, there's something constricting right? There's the flow of the water, the pressure is being constricted. There's no power in that. It's a trickle now. I mean, you can't, you know, 
um, if you have a if you have like a tip on the hose that allows you to to have a lot of water pressure like if you're washing your car or something and you put on that power nozzle you know the difference between a trickle and something that's able to just you know zap dirt off of your car and I know it's a very simple example but we can't expect when we got all this trash in the vessel that we're supposed to be we're supposed to be like that garden hose we're supposed to be allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us bringing his power bringing refreshment of the word bringing his peace all the fruits of the spirit along with it when we constrict when we have a constriction because of all the trash that's in us and from the world we can't expect power to flow through us it's just not going to happen he says as with a true heart we draw nigh and in the consciousness of our integrity that in holiness and sincerity of god we are walking in the world place ourselves in the light of God, we shall even in this life something of the great recompense of reward. I'm sorry, we shall receive even in this life something of the great recompense of reward the boldness of faith ever brings. All right, I'm going to read that again because I, I get what it's saying, but I want to make sure I'm conveying it to you properly. And with a true heart, we draw nigh. So we have a true heart. We have the kind of heart that God desires. We draw near to God. And then we're conscience, conscious of our integrity. Like we don't have our conscience bothering us. We don't have an evil conscience that we have things on this conscience that need to be repented of. Okay, we're, we're clear. And he says that in holiness and sincerity of God, we are walking in the world. So we're walking around in this world in holiness and sincerity of God. So we're in a right, we're in a strong place of righteousness with God. We're walking right with God. He said, we place ourselves in the light of God. Okay, so we're not ashamed. When you're ashamed of something, you don't want to come out into the light. I mean, remember Adam and Eve? They were ashamed of their sin and they were hiding from God. They thought they could hide from God. But, you know, John says in 1 John 1, he says, but if you walk in the, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and with God. I, it breaks down for me. Maybe we can put that up. But he's saying that we're in a strong place with God when we're walking in the light of God. You know, cockroaches don't like light, right? They scatter. But when we're right with God, we will stand in the light. He says, we shall receive, even in this life, something of the great recompense of reward the boldness of faith ever brings. So God's going to reward all of that with us having boldness. Because we're really going to have nothing holding us back. We're not, we're, the kink is out of the hose, right? We're, the, the junk is out, and now we, we're at full power. So God's going to give us the reward of obeying him by giving us boldness. I hope, that, I hope that's clear. Cast not away your boldness, for you have need of patience. He says, your boldness you cannot dispense with for a single moment. To the end of life, it is your only strength. Wow. That puts that in a new light, doesn't it? Cast it not away. Remember that without patience, in the persevering exercise and daily renewal of faith, you cannot inherit the promise. Between the faith that accepts a promise and the experience that fully inherits or receives it, there often lies years of discipline and training needed, needed to fit and perfect you for the inward possession of what God has to give. Okay, so he's saying there's time between faith and inheriting the promise that the faith was taking you to. There's, there's faith accepts the promise, but experience, there's years between faith and the experience of actually attaining the, the goal, right? And he's like, but in between, those in-between years, that's times of discipline. God's disciplining you. He's training you. He's perfecting you for the possession that he wants to give you inwardly. See, he, God can't give you things until you're ready on the inside. Just like you wouldn't give, even if a, even if this, this little child, say there was a five-year-old little boy that... He's just begging and crying, asking his dad, I want to run the chainsaw. And the dad's like, I'm sorry, son. I know you want it. And so the dad gives him a promise. 
one day when you're you're old enough and I feel like you're ready for it I'll let you handle the chainsaw but the father cannot give the chainsaw to the little boy who isn't ready for it even though he thinks he's ready that's the thing we might think we're ready for something that we we know that God has made available but God's like no you don't you don't even know you're not ready but if you will hang with me and be patient and you'll obey me and you'll submit yourself to this discipline and training then you'll have it it's just like anything like you know navy seals like just because somebody wants that they there's no way they would uh, the the people in charge of the navy seals they would be doing them a disservice if they threw them into a situation that a navy seal handles and they weren't even trained or disciplined uh, having the want to is not enough but having the want to and letting letting the years of training and discipline have their work that's what the bible's talking about when it's talking about patience like let, let patience have her work. And then you're going to get the thing that you have desired. And, you know, God's the one that knows. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So he knows when we're ready. He says, whether it be a promise to be realized in this world or the coming one, you have need of patience. Without perseverance, endurance, steadfastness, faith is vain. The only proof that it is a living, saving faith is that it holds fast its boldness firm unto the end. So we don't want to let go of faith, but we, we have to hang on even when it looks like nothing's happening. He says, Ye have need of patience that, having done the will of God, ye may receive the promise. Doing the will is the way to receive the promise. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that again because that is huge. Doing God's will is the way to receive the promise of God. And if you don't want to do the will, then you, you, you might as well know you're not going to get what was promised. You're just not. I mean, that's bad parenting <laughs> if you've ever had a child. And you, you give them what they want, whether or not they obey you. You're going to raise a child you won't even want to be around after a few years. But let me back this. He says, doing the will is to be the one thing that is to occupy us while we patiently wait. So in the in-between time of faith and then the, the desired end of the, of the promise, he says doing God's will is what we need to be doing. We need to be waiting on God. And I always think waiting on God kind of has that double meaning. Like we're waiting, like we're, time is passing and we're being patient. But also, I always also picture like a waiter at a restaurant okay they're serving they're waiting on someone at a restaurant means that you're serving them so while we are waiting on God we need to continue to serve him and do his will he says between God's giving the promise to Abraham and his receiving its fulfillment there lay years of the obedience of faith and each new act of obedience was crowned with new and larger blessing doing the will was the proof of his faith the occupation of his patience, the way to his blessing. So doing the will of God was proof that Abraham had faith. And the occupation of his patience was the way to his blessing. He says, Lo, I am come to do thy will, O God, with every Christian who puts his trust in the living Christ and enters the holiest of all to live there. Doing the will of God must be the link that unites the end to the beginning. Between the faith that accepts the promise and the experience that fully inherits it, there may be to us to be, okay, let me read it here, two, lots of commas. Between the faith that accepts the promise and the experience that fully inherits it, there may be to us two years of waiting and trial. These must be marked by the obedience of faith, by patient continuance in well-doing or we never can reach the promised end. So we have waiting, we have trial, there's obedience, there's uh, the obedience of faith. We're patiently continuing and well-doing. 
he says, or we can never reach the promised end. I think about, think about the Israelites going through the wilderness. Okay, they had, they hadn't reached their, they, they had the promises, but they had to continue on before they had the promise. And they pretty much, the Bible says, except for two men, which was Joshua and Caleb, the rest of them, God let them die in the desert. Um, those 20 years, uh, those above 20 years old. And then he said that the next generation will inherit the promise. We don't, we don't want to be like them. We don't want to uh, keep wandering around in the desert because we're not obeying God. We want to get to the desired end. He says, if we see to the doing of God's will, he will see to our inheriting the promise. Exactly. How many times did he say? He said to the Israelites, he said, you've tempted me 10 times over and I'm pretty much done. Um, so they weren't seeing to the, the doing of God's will, so they didn't inherit the promise. The sure mark of true faith, the blessed exercise of life within the veil, the proof of the power of Christ, the obedient one within us, the blessedness of fellowship with God will all come with this doing his will. I'm going to go over those again. So here's what you get with doing God's will. The sure mark of true faith, the blessed exercise exercise of life within the veil. So you get to have life within the veil. You get proof of the power of Christ. You get the obedient one living within you. You get the blessedness of fellowship with God. I mean, those are huge. To do the will of God is the only way to God and his presence. Therefore, day by day, hour by hour, let this be our motto. Patience, that having done the will, ye inherit the promise. It will, we're almost done here. I know it's a kind of a long teaching. Uh, in closing, he says, It will take time and trouble to get the heart under the complete mastery of the thought. I am every moment to be doing nothing but the will of God. Jesus Christ lives so. He, our leader, will teach it us. He, our life, will live it in us. He, our high priest, will by his spirit in this new and living way bring us in very deed nigh to God. Boldness, courage, bravery, the chief of the manly virtues. Patience, one of the loveliest of the gentler sisterhood of passive graces. In each full Christian character, the two must be combined. Cast not away your boldness, for ye have need of patience. Boldness to undertake, patience to carry out the doing of God's will. I love that. So he's like, yeah, there's these manly virtues like boldness. And then there's these gentler graces like patience, and they have to combine, they have to come together to be, bring this about. He says, O believer, let the truth enter deep into thee. Boldly, patiently doing the will is the way to inherit the promise. Well, thank you for sticking with me through this. I know this was a, kind of a longer uh, teaching, but I think it was well worth the time. Uh, I'm praying that you are inspired and encouraged by these teachings and uh, hope to see you again soon. God bless.